The title of the sermon today is To the Praise of God's Glory, and the scripture reading will be from Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, and it will be read by Ken Woodworth. Blessed be the God and Father. Let me see now. Okay, okay there. Start again. Okay. Go ahead. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Amen. These are the encouraging words of God. Thank you, Father, for revealing your plan of salvation to your church. We are forever grateful. Amen. Amen. You know, these verses are filled with great hope, not only for us, but actually for all humanity and for all those who will accept and receive what God is telling us in these verses. God the Father has delegated to Jesus great responsibility towards us in his love, which gr Jesus graciously accepted in love because he is the member of the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I just do like to read a, a brief quote from an article from GCI. We know that one of GCI mottos is you're included. But do you know what that means to me? Uh, Mr. Tikash wrote this. It means that we seek to love one another the way the Trinity loves, to care for one another in a way that celebrates our created differences while still being together. The Trinity is a perfect model of love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit enjoy perfect unity while remaining distinct divine person. As Athanasius puts it, unity in Trinity Trinity in unity. The love expressed within the Trinity teaches us the, significant, the significance of loving relationship within God's kingdom. And in these verses, the Apostle Paul is not addressing the whole world. We need to remember this. He is addressing those who are called by God the Father and who are given the gift of hearing the voice of our great shepherd, Jesus Christ. And we are blessed to be able to hear the voice of Jesus. It's a gift that we have been given. And in the original Greek, the section of uh, Ephesians 1, uh, 3 to 14, is a long, elegant sentence. Paul shows that the triune God initiated and accomplished cosmic reconciliation and redemption for the praise of his glory. This is a quote from the ESV Bible, and it's, it says a lot, doesn't it? 
that God initiated and accomplished cosmic reconciliation and redemption for the praise of his glory. And those who are not yet given this revelation about who Jesus is and what he came to do are like men who are both blind and deaf. They have been rescued by God from darkness, but they do not know it yet. Because we were in that state before, and Ephesians 5, 8 is very clear on this. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 8. So they've been rescued, people in the world, but they do not know it yet, just like we the same thing that happened to us before God opened our minds to these wonderful truths. And uh, it is God who heals the hearing and the sight as he does it in a very mysterious way. But we know he does it because we see evidence of it as, as, as we heard in the speaking of life. And today, as we read these verses, we will consider what the Apostle Paul is saying to the church, to the called out ones, and what he is saying to us. So we need to take this personally, individually, and collectively as God's community. And of course, anybody who reads this as a church and goes through these verses, it applies to the, the whole church of God. And so as we read and consider these verses, we are not to forget that in Jesus, God the Father reconciled the whole world to himself, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5. And because we have been given the undeserved grace to understand, this leads to humility and not arrogance, because we didn't do anything to deserve this. The difference, be the difference between us and those who are not yet converted is that by God's grace, this revelation has been given to God's people. And the sacrifice paid for both us and they is exactly the same. Consequently, as we stop and think about that, we really have no bragging rights. And we are not to forget what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 5, He said, therefore, as one trespass leads, led to condemnation of, for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And we read that in other verses as well. We read that in Hebrews in other places that Jesus died for all. He didn't just die for the few. And um, I realize not every Christian believe this, but the Bible is very clear that Christ's sacrifice was for all. In other words, what God has done for us and for all men does not depend on us. It all originates with God in eternity before we were ever created. And this is very important to understand because when we understand this truth, it will change our perception of both people in the church and people outside the church. The same sacrifice that was paid for me was also paid for everyone who has lived, lives, and who will live in the future. And Karl Barth says it well. Um, later, these biblical truths were also expanded by Thomas and James Torrance and many others, but this is what Karl Barth wrote. And he wrote, but all of this is not a private arrangement between him and us. He is not merely our Lord and representative as he takes our own place, he takes also that of our fellows and brothers. The relevance of his being and action is for ours, but also for that of others who are beside and around us, in likeness with us. 
they know less than we are determined by him. The knowledge of the man Jesus includes the knowledge and enclosure of our own and every other human existence is his. And this is from Church Dogmatics, uh, volume four um, by Karl Barth on page 519 to 521. But we read here that God, and it, it goes with the, what the Bible says, that God died for all men. He, he died for my neighbors. He died for your neighbors who do not know God yet. He died for our family members who do not know of God yet. They are reconciled and yet do not know it. The world has been reconciled to God. As, as again, the Bible is very clear about what it says. So the important point as we go to Ephesians is to realize that we all need the sacrifice of Jesus because the, like the rest of the world, we are also sinners in need of the salvation of Jesus Christ. So we'll plunge into the word of God found in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. And as we read this, I, I guess a comparison would be that we are like scuba divers who have been given the revelation that there's a treasure where we are going to plunge. But the, the water is murky, the water is muddy. And as we dive in the water, we see the treasure, but we do not see it very clearly. It's still fuzzy, it's still, some parts are undefined. And it's, it's a comparison of what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, that for now we see in a mirror dimly. So what, what we read in Ephesians 1 is something that just explodes our reason, <laughs> it just explodes our imagination. Because what God is saying is so great that it almost seems unbelievable to the human mind, but yet it is the truth because this is the inspired word of God. So he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in him. So what does this verse tell us? Well, the Apostle Paul is telling the Ephesian Christians, and the church in Ephesus was made of Gentiles and Jewish people, that God the Father has blessed us in Jesus Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. This means that God has not withheld anything from us. And the Apostle Peter tells us the same thing in different words in uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4. He says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence and by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desires. All the blessings that the Apostle Paul is talking about is this very precious gift that we are partakers or participants of the divine nature through Jesus of Nazareth, the perfect man in heaven representing all of us. And the word partaker has to do with being a participant and one who belongs and shares fellowship with God himself through the man Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I think that I am participating, that I am a participant, and I fellowship with God, it just explodes my imagination. Because no man could have come up with such a lofty future for us. This is a God thing, as the expression goes. Think about it for a moment. We will participate in the, internal, in the eternal relationship of the one who fr freely created everything that exists 
out of nothing, including this incredibly vast universe, the pinnacle of which is man who is created in God's image. We are going to participate in that relationship, that eternal relationship of the triune God through the man Jesus. There is no greater blessing than being able to participate in this divine relationship, not as God, but as perfected men and women in the man Jesus. So we'll always retain our humanity. We'll always retain our distinctiveness. But in the man Jesus, we are going to be able to participate in that triune loving relationship for all eternity. This is what awaits us. Before everything was created, we were already in God's mind and plans that we, sh that we should be perfect as he is, that is holy and blameless before him. This is an awesome plan and miracle that God does because in our presence and in my physical, present physical state, I know that I'm not blameless. I know that I'm not holy, and I know that I'm not righteous in myself. In my present state, I know that I cannot reach the height of perfection unless God gives it to me and to all other human beings who will accept it in faith. Because to attain that level of righteousness, God has to create in us a new heart and a new self. This is the grand miracle he has given to his people, the believing church. We have been given a new heart and a new self that will live on to eternity, that will be resurrected in Christ. And this is, ex that, is, is, is that is exactly God's plan. That, that is why it's all of God, all of him, and none of us. Everything was initiated by him and will be completed by him. We are the beneficiaries of an awesome, awesome grace. And any human analogies cannot really capture the fullness of this reality. One may think of a very poor child being adopted in a royal family where he would be considered as a son with all the privilege of royalty. There is nothing that that child could have done to merit such a physical blessing. And this pales into insignificance what God has prepared for us as we accept this precious gift of faith. And as we think about it, it just blows the mind and we have to accept it in faith because it comes from God and God is truth. God doesn't lie. And as we live our everyday life in the reality of this present world with its suffering, deaths, injustices, complexities, human relationships, some that are pleasant and some that are not so pleasant, it is good to, remind it, to be reminded that in the end of our life's journey in Jesus, with this ups and down in this life, that this life will end up in glory beyond imagination to the praise of God. And this is a tremendous encouragement as we go through this life and, and as we go and as we live every day because it's not, this life is not always easy. It has many surprises, some, some many turns and ups and unexpected turns. Uh, sometimes it has its good part and it has some difficult parts as well. Then in love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is a description of the work and intent of God the Father for us, which is being worked out in Jesus Christ. And this is why Jesus descended from heaven to earth. And I just like to read something very short from uh, Raising Adam, why Jesus descended into hell by Jared Dawson. 
and it's simple language, but he captures it so well. He says, how far did Jesus go to save us? Where did he have to journey in order to gather us from the farthest reaches of our separation from his father? Simply, he went farther than most of us have, have dared imagine. Jesus entered our mortal frailty and made his way faithfully through this world, not only with us, but as one of us. He engaged the dire effects of our sin in his healing work as he undid the ravages of illness, judgment, and demonic oppression. But more, Jesus undertook to receive in himself the fatal wounds of our betrayals, the cruel punishment of the cross, and the horrifying cry of God forsakenness. He went to the farthest extreme of human existence. All that he did on our behalf, Jesus came down in order to bring us up. He lived and died fully as a man in order to reconcile humanity entirely to God. Every time we proclaim the gospel, this is at the heart of the story we tell. One man gave his life for the many. Jesus descended fully into our death in order to raise us fully into life. So how blessed we are in the beloved eternal son of the father, the beloved son, Jesus. What is it that we have in Jesus, in the beloved? What are the blessings? In him, we have redemption through his blood. And there are many stories of human redemption, but they do not compare to what Jesus has done for us. I was reading a, a short article uh, in, in, as I was preparing this sermon of a story of redemption. And in, back in 2000, there was a 23-year-old man called Cornelius Anderson uh, his nickname was Mike, and he was arrested for robbing a Burger King at gunpoint. And he was sentenced to 13 years in prison, released on bail, and told to await, await orders on when to show up to serve his time. But the orders, the order never came. Due to the clerical error, Anderson never went to prison. But instead of using his freedom to commit more crimes, Anderson started his own construction business became a huge football, uh, football coach and volunteered at his local church. He also got married, had three children and became a well-liked member of his community. And 13 years later, the state discovered their error and put Anderson behind bars for nearly one year. And as the case received international coverage an online petition for his release gained more than 35,000 signatures. And after a court hearing, and which lasted a mere 10 minutes, the judge conceded that Anderson was, was a changed man and granted him credit for the years that he should have been in prison. And a teary-eyed Anderson walked out of the courthouse with his wife and daughters, telling reporters that he was grateful to God. And, you know, Mike redeemed his past by his changed behavior and by the clemency of a judge. But Mike, by his changed behavior and by the clemency of a judge, could not be given internal, eternal life on that basis, a life that, that would last into eternity. Because it, it is only through Jesus that the gift of eternal life can be given, and it does not depend on us. It does not depend on our changed behavior. Our reconciliation depends on God himself completely, who originated it and who has completed it. You know, in the computer world, some individuals who are thieves use ransomware to take over computer information valuable to companies. And the companies are threatened that if they do not pay, they will lose their, all their valuable information. And they have to pay a ransom or money in exchange. And kidnappers and pirates, as we know, use uh, that same technique to extort money from their victims. But, you know, as we think of Jesus, to rescue us from the captivity of sin, Jesus gave himself 
as a ransom. He gave his life for us that we could be rescued. The, the consequence or the cost of sin is death. And, and Jesus accepted these consequences, these consequences for all of us. This is quite an act of humiliation, an act of love, an act of self-sacrifice. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 to 6, it says, For there is one man and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. He gave himself as a ransom for all. And then we have the forgiveness of sin, of our trespasses. The good news is that we were forgiven before we ever asked for forgiveness. Because God has taken care of our sins before the foundation of the world, as we were predestined to be holy and blameless before him. We are all forgiven in Christ, whether we know it or not. Our responsibility, once we come to know it, is to accept this forgiveness in faith. And when we become aware of our sinfulness, we, we need to confess our sin and bring them before God. But it's for our benefit because we are already forgiven in his beloved son. Because Jesus has already taken care of our sins. So consequently, we have no need for false guilt. Because God, in Christ, sees us as blameless and guiltless. This is quite a miracle, isn't it? And because we are guiltless and forgiven, we are called to live in a new life Jesus has given us. We are to participate and live as adopted children of our great God. And our adoption has changed everything about our lifestyle as we now live to please our Heavenly Father. And there is no better way to live and no better freedom than to live in the obedience of faith, in the obedience of the commandments of God, which are not burdensome. And because we have been forgiven, we can extend that grace to others as well. And making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. And again, this is a great privilege for people in the church to know that the mysterious plan of God, his will for us and for all those who would come to faith in him, it's a mystery that we can only, that can only be received by having our minds opened by the Holy Spirit to this wonderful truth. And I know to the world it may sound arrogant and it may sound foolish, but that is what the truth of God, because God has created his church. And Jesus is the head of the church. He's, he's created the church and not we. And we didn't write what's in the Bible. It was inspired by God and it's consistent from one end to the other about this great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have been given eyes to see and ears to hear. And knowing our destiny helps us to navigate the daily walk of life. We have been given knowledge of where our dying world is destined. Because God has already ransomed it. He is presently working to transform all human beings who accept this wonderful mystery of faith. And as we walk in, as sojourners and pilgrims in this life, knowing that our real citizenship is not of this world, but in the kingdom of God, where lies our hope, we positively and constructively contribute to this world as we walk and live in the hope, knowing that God's plan is magnificent and will not be thwarted. So we know that this world is going to be changed. It's going to be, it's going to be a new world one day. And then, He's going to unite all things in heaven and on earth. And we have examples of, of how things can become beautiful 
when working in unison. And as I was thinking of example, the example that came to my mind was the example of a full orchestra. You know, a standard orchestra generally has four sections. It has the woodwinds, the brass, the percussion, and the strings. And there may also be a piano, which is sometimes included as a keyboard section. But the instruments are usually grouped together in their section and usually in proportion to one another. And what they produce in unison is a beautiful, beautiful sound as they, as they follow the direction of the conductor. And it becomes even more beautiful when you add human voices to that sound. It's, it's a beautiful mix, pleasant to the ear, unifying. And it's beautiful because there is unison and no division. That's what makes it beautiful. Sin does the contrary, sin divides. But at the right time, sin will be no more. The triune God and, and human beings will be in complete unison. Divisions will, be, will no longer exist between human beings. We will be united by perfect love, perfect respect, perfect gentleness, perfect joy, perfect kindness, and so on. The troubles we may be going through now are nothing compared to the future that is awaiting us. In fact, Jesus will bring all things together, meaning that the whole of the universe will also be in harmony, in unison. Creation will no longer be in decay. It will no longer be in travail. And that's why Paul said in Romans 8, 20 to 21, he said, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This is beautiful as we see the surgery because sin destroys and we see decay and we see problems everywhere. But that will change. And when the children of God are glorified, the whole creation is going to be renewed. There's going to be harmony. There's going to be unity. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. It's interesting and encouraging to read that we have already obtained this, this inheritance as we live in the now, but not yet. We have obtained, it says, an inheritance. Not we will, we have. George Ladd titles one of his books, The Presence of the Future. And this title captures well what the Apostle Paul is saying in this verse, doesn't it? As difficult as this life sometimes appears and is, we need to live with the assurance as God has already given us what he's promised in Christ. And we'll see the full realization of this wonderful truth at his return on the earth. And in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. See, Christ has already paved the way for us all. And this objective truth found in Christ becomes reality for us when God awakens our faith in him. And we put our faith in the faith of Christ, in the faithfulness of Christ. And accepting this truth in faith impl implies repentance. It implies a complete change of mind. Where our trust for the present and the future lies in Christ rather than in ourselves or in what this world can provide. So there's a complete shift of trust. 
from this world, from ourselves, to God and his sure promises. Right now, we do not have the fullness of this promise, but we have the assured guarantee of, of God that we are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, the guarantee of this possession. And when we, are, when we place our trust in the Father's promise in his beloved, in Jesus Christ, we were sealed. And the word that the apostle used in the ancient world meant legal signature, which guaranteed the promise of what was sealed. So we have a guarantee. So this is why we see the Apostle Paul was so excited in writing Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 as one sentence, because it's one long sentence. What God has done, is doing, and will do in Christ is absolutely mind-boggling. It blows human reasonableness apart. It explodes it. And, and the choice we are given is to accept this wonderful purpose of God for all humanity in faith to his praise. And the greatest gift that God has given us is his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus is the greatest gift to humanity. All the promises of God the Father are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who has given the responsibility to bring all what God has promised to fruition in and we can be guaranteed that he will not fail because he is God. And in him, all the promises and fulfillment of God's promises are in Jesus. And this is to the praise of God's glory for which we are forever thankful. Let us pray.